for our Facebook page. In these strange times, we're thrilled to be able to present virtual editions of our programming and use live streaming to create a kind of digital sta stage that can serve Town Hall's community of curious and engaged Seattleites. Folks from well beyond Seattle, too, we're finding. Like everyone who's willing to stare or talk into their computers right now, some for the very first time, I want to thank Clifford and Adam for helping us keep the conversation aloft here at Town Hall. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing the stream via our YouTube page. Uh, to enable real-time closed captioning, you can click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. Uh, the video will also be available for rewatching immediately following tonight's broadcast. Tonight's conversation, you know what, I should have checked. I'm not exactly sure, but typically the conversations last 30 to 45 minutes. Somewhere in there, afterwards, Thompson and Chats will answer your questions. They'll select questions from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. You can also vote on which questions our speakers can answer first by clicking the arrow next to the question to upvote it. We can't guarantee that they'll be able to answer every question, but they'll try to get to as many as possible. Upcoming town hall events in live stream include Dar Jamal, Bearing Witness to the End of Ice, uh, as well as appearances by Michael Shermer, Casey Schwartz, Frank Wilderson, David Sachs, uh, the fellows from Welcome to Night Vale, Kirk Bloodsworth, and Sister Helen Prejean. Know that we're also adding many programs every day, as well as new events being released in podcast form, and that many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form in our digital media library already. So in short, poke around the media tab on our homepage, and over the coming weeks, Town Hall will provide you with many ways to stay plugged in in the present, but also plenty of rabbit holes to climb down from the past. Cool. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors, Arts and Culture, in particular, comes courtesy for Culture, Arts Fund, the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But as anybody who attends Town Hall knows, um, we are a member-supported organization, and it is our members, nearly 6,000 of you, who truly make this place possible. And I want to thank all of our members in the audience with us tonight. Meanwhile, those rumors you've heard, they're absolutely true. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large are under significant strain right now, you might say, and we hope you will consider a gift during this difficult time by making a donation uh, using the donate button at the bottom of your screen or by going to our website and becoming a member. You can make a donation online or text Town Hall to 44321 to give. Independent booksellers are also feeling the squeeze and I sure hope you're considering purchasing a copy of Cliff's book tonight. Uh, it is one of the, sorry, uh, one of the reasons we brought you all together, after all, to learn more about the work. And if you are, I hope you'll consider buying it from our friends at Third Place Books, tonight's bookstore partner. The easiest way is to use the link right here on the live stream page or in the comment fields on the various other platforms. We heart Third Place Books. They're kind of the town hall of booksellers. So we hope you will consider picking one up, pick up, picking up a copy tonight. Okay. Clifford Thompson's personal essays, writing on books, film, jazz, and American identity have appeared in numerous publications, including the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Village Voice, the Times Literary Supplement, Three Penny Review, the LA Review of Books, many others. He is the author of the novel Signifying Nothing from 2009, as well as his 2015 memoir, Twin of Blackness, and the collection Love for Sale and Other Essays, which won him a Whiting Writers Award for nonfiction in 2013. A contributor to the Best American Essays of 2018, for over a dozen years, he served as the editor of Current Biography and taught creative nonfiction writing at Sarah Lawrence, Columbia, and NYU, among other august institutions. Adam Schatz is a contributing editor at the London Review of Books, a former literary editor of The Nation. He has worked at the New York Times Book Review, Lingua Franca, and The New Yorker. Schatz is the editor of Prophets Outcast, a century of dissident Jewish writing about Zionism and Israel. And he's contributed numerous, numerous articles, I should say, on politics, music, and culture to The Nation, The New York Review of Books, The Village Voice, and The New York Times. And you know, we're all spending a lot of time at our desks right now, and you can learn a lot by somebody and, and, and by what their desk, their desk can tell you a lot about, um, about a person's personality and interests. And uh, tonight in the green room, the virtual room, green room, that is, I learned that both of our speakers this evening are avid jazz fans. <laughs> well, if you poke around a little bit on Cliff's website, it's pretty obvious on the homepage, a shot at his desk shows a picture of Coleman Hawkins right above the desk, so it's like a practical shrine, it seems. Yeah. So in the Q&A, just a prompt, you might ask him about jazz. I have a feeling they know a lot and have a lot to share. In the meantime, they're here to talk about Thompson's book, What It Is, Race, Family, and One Thinking Black Man's Blues. Please join me in welcoming Adam Schatz and Clifford Thompson. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. and. Uh, 
Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's great to be here and a, and a real honor and a, a pleasure because uh, uh, Cliff Thompson is uh, a writer I, I greatly admire. Um, I love this book and, and Cliff is also a friend. So um, yes, great indeed. to see you this evening. You too. Um, Cliff, I, you know, I, I remember when you first described this book to me and mm -hmm. it, as I recall, it, it, it originated as, as an essay about, uh, about Joan Didion. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, what it was about Joan Didion's writing that spoke to you so powerfully, and why, at that moment, were you were you thinking about her so intensely? Sure, sure. I uh, became fascinated um, a number of years ago with the the new journalists, you know, the so called new journalists, capital N, capital J, um, Tom Wolfe, Gay Talese, Hunter Thompson, Norman Mailer, people like that, and um, but Didion uh, to me stood out from that group just uh, for a couple of reasons. Just from the for the um, what I would say is the the intimacy of her voice, uh, for one thing, um, and another thing that fascinates me about Didion uh, and a quality I greatly admire is her ability to look below the surface of things to see. Um, more of what's really going on, you know. She she doesn't she doesn't deal in uh, what's called uh, conventional wisdom or received wisdom. You know, she she does not take anybody's word for anything. So uh, she is she is willing to look at things for uh, for what they are instead of um, just kind of reporting what's in her own head. You know, um, didn't didn't she, didn't she famously say that a writer is always selling someone out? Yes, she she did say that. She did say that, and and um, and reading her work, it's uh, it's it's easy to see what she means. Um, but you know, I think her uh, she may sell people out, but I think her her loyalty, her greater loyalty, is to the real story and and to the truth. You know, a great example of that is um, if you look at uh, she has a, a a volume of collected uh, collected nonfiction called um, "We Tell Ourselves Stories in Order to Live" and um, uh, reading through that, there's uh, there's a piece on the so-called Central Park Five, and um, you know uh, people are familiar with that case from the, the late '80s when the five young African American men were accused and convicted of uh, brutally beating and raping a, a, a woman in Central Park in, the, in New York in the late '80s. There was all but unanimity in uh, about their guilt at the time. Um, but if you look back among one, among 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 liberals as well as conservatives, among among everybody, you know, liberals, yeah. conservatives, uh, you name it. Uh, if you look back, though, uh, one of the, as far as I know, one of the only voices, uh, or or one of the only prominent voices questioning the wisdom of that decision was Didion's. As I recall, she said, "Look, there there really is no evidence." Uh, uh, indicating the guilt of these men, and she was she was pill she was pilloried for that. I remember when the piece came out in the New York mm -hmm. Review of Books, and she was mm -hmm. she was ridiculed, and some of the criticism even had a kind of misogynistic ring to it. Like, sure. what's this woman saying? Right, sure, sure, sure. But who does she you know, think she is? Who does she think she is? But thirty odd years later, we see you know the the so called Central Park Five are now known as the Exonerated Five because everybody understands they didn't do it. So so that you know that that's that's an example of Didion's ability to just look at things, look at what's in front of her, you know, as, as opposed to uh, listening to what other people are saying or, or looking at what seems to be going on. So I admire that quality of hers uh, greatly. And uh, I think I think we'd be we'd be remiss not to mention that one of the people who was calling uh, for the heads of those of those young men, some of whom <laughs> were really boys at the time and who still insists yeah. on their guilt as the current occupant in the White House, who absolutely who, who recommends disinfectant for <laughs> just for, for attacking the coronavirus. Yes, yes, as yes. Of this gives, evening. You, gives you an indication of uh, where but she would. She, she, in a way. I mean, look, she, uh, Didion, of course, wrote on Charles Manson, and as you said, she had a always had a feeling for for you know what Ralph Ellison called the lower frequencies. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, um, even mm -hmm. if she didn't predict Trump, I don't think a figure like Trump was out of her purview. He was he was in the realm mm -hmm. of the imaginable for her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, no, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. And so you were going you, to do. Yeah. So you were going to do this book about Didion, and was did that predate Donald Trump's election, or or was it just after? You know, it's it all happened around the same time. I um, 
I signed up to do the, the book and it was going to be largely, if not mostly about Didion. And then uh, the 2016 election happened. Um, and uh, that of course was all anybody could think about. And with, you know, what, what I've described as Didion's ability to, um, to look at what's going on and look at what's in front of her and not be influenced by, by other people or by, uh, you know, by her preconceived ideas, that seemed a, a, a great and essential quality to, uh, to bring to, to the climate at the time to figure out what was going on, you know? And so that became the, the focus of the, the book I decided to write. Mm. Yeah. You, you, say, you say at one point um, uh, about Didion uh, that there's a kind of jazz-like quality to her writing. I'd never yes. heard Didion being linked to jazz. I wonder whether right. you could, could elaborate on that a little bit. Sure, sure. Um, it, it seems to me just in the structure of her sentences. I mean, she, she writes these wonderful long sentences with uh, plenty of uh, dependent clauses. And um, it seems to me that there is an analogy to be drawn between the structure of her sentences and, uh, the, and, and, and the structure or qualities of, of a great jazz solo. You know, um, some, sometimes um, when a, uh, you know, for example, a horn player is, is, uh, is is taking a solo. Um, the, uh, uh, the 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 theme of it will take him kind of into into a into a side road, you know, and then but then he makes his way back to the to the to the main theme, and and um, that seemed to me comparable to the way that Didion's um, uh, dependent clauses often often seem to stray for a bit and then come back, and but it, but it's all but it's seamless. I mean, it's it's absolutely. Not just grammatical, but but beautiful, and I would say musical, which she mm. is able to accomplish. So, mm. Um, mm. yeah, yeah. Your book is a a really compelling mix of of, mm. of memoir, of of essay, of, of political uh, commentary, and uh, and in a kind of surprising turn toward the end, uh, uh, reportage. Uh, mm. Almost like an mm. investigative reportage. Now, there's a moment um, at the beginning of the book where you are recalling a conversation that you had with uh, a fellow student when you were an undergraduate uh, at Oberlin, I think. And mm. this student, uh, uh, I think he was a white student, uh, remarked um, or was, was remembering a conversation. Uh, that he had had with a, I think, a, a relative of his who had been so uh, uh, shocked by uh, and troubled by by the Watergate uh, mm. break in and the surveillance right, right. that that she cried and and you said really I mean like because you had grown up in this right. in this home uh, where no, you had no reason to. Samsung yeah. watches, earbuds. <laughs> yeah. We'll be right back. That were you, yeah. Where you where you had had no reason uh, to um, to trust to place your trust in the government. Right, now, right. And yet, many years later, yeah. 2016, mm -hmm. an older Cliff Thompson is really startled, shaken up mm -hmm. by the mm -hmm. election of Donald Trump. Sure. What, what sure. do you think changed? I mean, uh, did something change yeah. over those 20, well, 30 years, let's say? I, I wouldn't say anything changed. So just to put it in context a little bit, I grew up in uh, Washington, D.C. In, uh, uh, in, in an all black neighborhood. Um, you know, it, it was it was possible to go days or weeks without seeing a black person where I grew up. And, um, you know, we, we were, of course, in the na nation's capital, but uh, but also just removed from the, the, the scene of politics. But nobody because we were an all black community and, and because of uh, you know, conditions that blacks have historically faced in this country, um, there was very little surprise about something like Watergate because, um, you know, I, I, I think maybe the surprise was that, uh, was that Nixon got caught, not, not so much that he, that he did what he did. So 
so yeah, so when when I was when I was in my twenties, and uh, uh, a friend, a uh, uh, man I was friends with at, at the time, was recalling uh, having been in elementary school during uh, Watergate, and uh, he recalled that his teacher cried. And I said, "Why did this teacher cry? Hey, why did your teacher cry?" And he said, "Well, I think common sense would tell you that that um, you know she was she was disillusioned by uh, that that, uh, that the you know the head of the head of the federal government would do something like this." And you know, I just remember thinking at the time, well, um, well, as I say in the book, in, you know, in order to be disillusioned, you have to first have illusions, and and we really had none. Um, so about uh, about what was you know what, what the what the government was capable of. So um, I mean that 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 suspicion of uh, figures in government was was always there. I think what. Uh, I think what caught me off guard decades later was that um, a figure who was so, you know, you know, I, it, I don't think there's, uh, it's unprecedented for a person with racist views to to occupy the White House. Certainly, that's that's not that's not unprecedented. What was unprecedented was just the nakedly xenophobic uh, character or tenor of the campaign, and the fact that. Um, the majority of, of white voters embraced this man anyway, even given just the the nakedness of uh, of what he stood for, and and you know the the wall and the whole the whole thing. So I think that there was nothing um, there was nothing coded about it. There it wasn't uh, exactly. It was, yeah. These were not these are not dog whistles. You know this is yeah. you know, whatever the opposite of a dog whistle yeah. is above. Yeah. yeah. So so I think I think I think that's how I would explain it. Yeah. 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 So. Um, so you, you were you were mentioning that you know you grew up in you grew up in D.C. in a in, a, in an all black neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You ended up going to Oberlin, mm -hmm. and and you know you you write in your book about how you know you you ended up forming a circle of friends, many if not most of whom uh, were white. You you say something that's that's kind of striking. You say that you know my grounding in an all black environment ironically made me open to them. Can you can you unpack that a bit? Why sure. why do you think that particularly made you so so open to being in that kind of setting? Sure, sure. I, you know, as I said, I, you know, I, I grew up uh, in an all black environment and so my formative and most impressionable years were spent uh, free of any of the sort of uh, micro, you know, what are called microaggressions, right? So, you know, it's interesting. When I was in college, uh, the the most stridently separatist uh, students that, uh, whom I met, many of many of them had grown up in integrated circles, and um, and so they, you know, they grew up during their formative years when uh, with, with you know black and white kids who, as as kids will do, will say pretty much anything, you know. Uh, nothing is off limits for kids. So you know you can make fun of skin color. You can you know uh, make fun of somebody's hair, whatever whatever it is. And I think these are the experiences that that stick with you. I didn't have those experiences. Um, by the time I got to college, you know I was 18 years old. I went to a liberal college, um, and that's not to say that the that the students there were you know uh, had been shorn of the possibility for racism, but. By and large, uh, they they had liberal views, right? So, um, this was my first real exposure to uh, to being a sort of minority where I was. You know, I've always been a minority in the nation, but this is the first time I've been a, a, a minority, where, you know, where where I lived. But I think I had a certain amount of just security, a personal, um, you know, feel, feelings of security from having grown up in an all black environment, and and um, and I just did not, uh, I did not feel that that sort of um, uh, distrust or animosity that you might understandably feel if you had grown up in the situation that, I, you know, the other situation I've described. So I, I, I think that is yeah. what accounts for it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, too, when you think about it in relationship to some of the yeah. arguments that were made uh, during the Brown v. Board of Education dis dis decision, the psychological mm -hmm. arguments about about mm -hmm. uh, um, about the self-esteem uh, the effects on self-esteem of black mm. children's self-esteem of of segregation um, mm -hmm. uh, there has been in recent years a shift among some some black parents away from the uh, kind of uh, 
of an integration paradigm and more towards the view that that uh, uh, not separation, obviously, obviously not separate and unequal, but that some, but that a more kind of homogeneous uh, environment might be more conducive to promoting self confidence, like self esteem, sure. before going out into this, yeah, as opposed to suffering the kind of microaggressions that that you're describing right right yeah i mean you know there, there were two things going on going on um i was in that all-black environment but also i just came from a very loving family you know um, yeah. our yeah. neighborhood was definitely uh, uh you know i would say working class to working poor um uh my parents didn't go to college upper but i have lower, upper lower middle class didn't you upper, say? yeah lo, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah as, as i thought um uh, so you know, my, my parents hadn't gone to college, but my my I have older siblings than they had, and and so um, you know, I, I had a a model for uh, people who had just assumed a certain amount of success in their lives. Um, so yeah, so and, and so this is what I grew up with, and and uh, mm. you know, I, I was lucky. Mm. I was lucky. Mm. Mm. Some of these events, I think you you say at some point in the in, in your book, coincided with your realization that uh you were now older than the eight than 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 your father was when he died because your father was 54 when he died wasn't he yeah he was almost 54 yeah um yeah. yes it, it's uh it, it was interesting um the day trump was in my, my older sister um uh emailed me one day to inform me that uh on the day of trump's inauguration I had lived exactly as long as my father. So I was almost 54 years old. And so in a way it felt like, um, you know, so I was 11 when my father died. He, he was 53, almost 54. And um, I think I always had it in my mind that, that uh, getting to that, that age was, was, a, was a kind of a marker and anything beyond that was some sort of like uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. So sure enough, you know, I, I reached that age and the uncharted, uncharted territory I found myself in was, was uh, living under the the presidency of Donald Trump, um, and you know, as I say in the book, fifty three. When you're younger, fifty three seems like an age by which you just have it all figured out, right? Um, fifty, <laughs> you know. Uh, after that election, I I kind of concluded that I had figured out nothing. You know, I I was uh, I I was now as old as my father. I was you know about to be older than my father, and and. Uh, and and the and it felt like the ground had had disappeared from under me with this election. That's, cer that's certainly yeah. the sense that you uh, convey in the book, and the and mm. you know the, the book has the feeling of a kind of uh, I mean it can't be a buildings roman. You're too old for a buildings roman, but it <laughs> but it is a it is yeah. a story of formation or of a, or of a of a of a middle aged man undergoing a kind of belated education or 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 or, or wake up call or. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, one has the sense that 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 at that time in 2016, you really felt um, uh, at sea. And of course, uh, as we were discussing earlier, uh, at sea is the title of one of the paintings mm. uh, in your uh, in your book. The paintings in your book are your paintings, and yes, there are some, yes. some remarkable images, and they they work in 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 sort of beautiful counterpoint, I think, to the prose. Um, Thank you. Thanks. This is the first time that you, is this the this is the, is this the first time that you've uh, accompanied your work with your own uh, paintings? Um, yeah, it's like I uh, two two of my previous books have my paintings on the cover, but this is the first one that uh, uh, in which the the paintings are in the interior as well. So, so yeah, the the uh, there this book has five chapters and an introduction, and and each of those uh, at the start there's a there's an image that I painted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So you you write um. There's a there's a, a line that I found rather striking about the students that you met um, at uh, at Oberlin. Some of the the white mm -hmm. students you uh, became close to while you mm -hmm. were there. Yeah. Uh, you say that um, that being white uh, seemed uh, to exempt one from the question of who one is. I mean, this is a very Baldwinian kind of sentence, and I'm wondering mm. whether you could uh, explain uh, how that worked out in practice. What, what, in, in what ways did they seem to be 
unaware that they even had to pose the question of their right. identity. Sure, sure. You know, so I, I grew up mostly in the 1970s. I was born in 1963. Um, so, my, you know, my consciousness started to form, I would say, in the, in the late 1960s. And um, there were there were things that uh, I, I would say that especially then uh, black Americans would would or, or black people, I should say, would get the message in a hundred subtle ways that um, that they were not really Americans as much as anybody else. Right. So um, an example I often use is um, um, I, I was uh, I, I think um, I was young when the uh, the Crayola, the 64 pack of Crayola crayons came out. Do you remember this? Remember this uh, this thing? Mm -hmm. um, it's very popular. Uh, there was one called Flesh. There was a crayon called Flesh. Right? Guess guess what color the flesh was? Right? Wasn't the color of my skin. So, you know, if you're if you're you know seven years old or eight years old and you see a crayon called Flesh, you might not consciously think, hmm, that's that's not the color of my flesh. That therefore. I must not be who they're uh, aiming this at, but you know, on some level, it, it sort of registers. Um, there is uh, there was a phrase that was used often when I was a boy, um, and you don't hear it so much anymore. Although I will say I saw it in the in the Times uh, the other day, and the phrase is uh, "all American good looks." Mm -hmm. right? So, <laughs> you know, somebody says "all American good looks," generally they're not talking about like Samuel L. Jackson, right? They're mm -hmm. uh, they have they have another look in mind. So you know, if you, if if you use a, a phrase like "all American good looks," wh what does that say about people who don't look that way, right? Yeah, y you know. So you you suddenly get the 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 message that you're not really an American. So so when I went to college and um, I was around a lot of white students, um, you know, you know, the other message you get, of course, is that there there is a some sort of fundamental difference, even though if, even if nobody can say what it is between black people and white people, right? So they're they're you know you just you just hear that from from the cradle, and so you start to wonder what um, what it is you what it is you have in common with these people, and and what and what the differences between you are, right? So um, and so you know it 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 can become a a, a process of sort of questioning who you are in a way that you never did when when everybody you were around looked like you so that that's that's what i that's what i would say and and certainly you know none of the none of the white students i met had ever struggled with the idea of am i an american you know mm. you know it's, it's like it's like struggling with the color of what color the sky is the question yeah. of what color the sky is you just don't think about right. it right right you know? right yeah. they just took it for granted that they sure. represented the norm the center exactly you know yeah yeah mm -hmm. You know, you 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 on the first page of your book. Um, well, let let me preface this by saying that you know a thinker who's been really clearly very important for you, um, not just in this book but in in your other work is uh, is Albert Murray. Sure. Right. Albert mm -hmm. Murray was a, a mentor of yours uh, yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And and Albert Murray uh, developed a whole theory right about black Americans as the so-called omni-Americans, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, no one is more American than black Americans. They've right. been here longer than anyone, aside from Native Americans. Right, they right. built the country, were never thanked for it, quite the contrary, right. <laughs> but right. um, to be black American is to be American. And, and, right. uh, and, and in, in a way to sort of represent Americanness in the most profound ways through music and culture as well. And, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and, and that's a theory that I think that, you know, you, your work has, you know, reflected You're writing on, on, on jazz, for example, but, um, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, you, you, you write on the first page that you've chosen to see yourself as an American. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, mm -hmm. you know, it's, and it's a phrase that, 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 uh, appears later in the book. And I, I so I, it just I wondered, you know, uh, to what extent is this self identification a choice, and to what is this, to what extent is it simply a fact of history that one one assumes perhaps consciously, but mm. it's not something that one. I mean, I think that you know Baldwin in his writing says, you know, this was something that he couldn't really run away from, even if he even if he wanted to. And when he right. was in France, he realized just how much of an American he was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I, I, I guess I would say I would reconcile those two ideas by saying that uh, you can you can choose to, you know, a, as you say, uh, a black person's uh, heritage and uh, is there, you know, heritage as an American is there. The choice, I suppose, is to is to recognize and embrace it. You know, it, uh, it's it's there regardless. But I think the choice is to is to either recognize and embrace it or turn your back on it. And I think. Um, you know, an understandable choice of uh, some people is to want to distance themselves from um, from a country that ha with with such a, a tradition of oppression of people of color. So you know, like you know, so so they will say defiantly, angrily, "I'm you know, don't call me an American. I'm not part of this mess." You know, I'm an, I'm, and, I'm African, or I'm right, uh, right. Exactly. You know, I'm exactly. a member of the black diaspora. I'm not, yeah, I mean. Right, right, right. Murray's, you know, Albert Murray's response to that was, look, uh, you know, you, you may look, uh, you may seem to be, you know, very, very, uh, you know, virile and manly with this, with the stance, but what you're doing is you're, you're giving up what belongs to you. You know, you're, you're conceding, you're ceding your birthright. Um, so I, that um, that message resonated with me deeply, mm. you know, at a time when um, mm. I was sort of, you know, questioning on a cultural level who I was. Um, along came, um, you know, I, I learned about uh, Albert Murray's book, The Omni Americans, and uh, it's probably it's not going too far to say that uh, the title essay of that collection changed my life. You know, mm. I, I I really it it really helped me make sense of things, mm. and to and and to embrace my place in this country, which is as valid as anyone else's. Mm. And, um, and that has been largely the foundation of, um, of how I felt since then. And, and what was significant about the 2016 election was that that was the first occasion when um, I had seriously sort of um, questioned, uh, questioned that view just a, just a little, uh, because um, as I said, you know, the, and, and it's not news, the majority of white voters in 2016 um, voted for Donald Trump. And, um, and of course they make up the majority, uh, whites make up the majority in the country. And um, so, the, you know, you have to kind of ask yourself again, do, do I want to identify with a, with a country who has elected this man? Is this, mm -hmm. is this something I really want to be a part of? Yeah. Do, I and, want and, to do I want to integrate into a burning house? Into a burning house, exactly, exactly. James Baldwin put it. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, yeah. Murray, you know, Murray's idea that, you know, uh, this Murray's argument, like, why should you give up what is yours? Why not mm -hmm. claim it? Right. Um, very much reflective of a kind of Tuskegee airman sensibility sure, in some ways. Sure. He shared yeah. that with Ralph Ellison. Mm -hmm. He was also, you know, very critical of, I mean, in a in a way that sometimes made him seem as if he were a bit of a neocon, very critical of protest literature. Um, yes. and yeah. of yeah. and of uh, the expression in fiction um, mm -hmm. or art of political mm -hmm. grievances. Right. And right. and this placed him uh, very much on the opposite side of someone like you know, Baldwin, who's another important influence for you. Now, right. I, you know, since this does seem to mark a shift to some degree in your own, in your own thinking, I'm wondering, could you, could you read this passage in your book um, about this disdain for what you would privately called uh, the victim elite? Sure, I think sure thing. This, this gives us a sense of where you were prior, maybe not just before the election, but at an earlier moment in your, in your mm -hmm. intellectual formation. Sure, sure, yeah. I'll just uh, read uh, a couple pages here. Um, I developed my own disdain for what I privately called the victim elite. This was the all but official membership of those who cherished their grievances, stroking them like pampered cats, erecting temples to their own alienation, temples founded every bit as much on exclusion as any southern good old boys club. Theirs was the kind of thinking that mimicked exclusion instead of fighting it that led, for example, Terry McMillan to say to the New York Times in 1992 in reference to John Updike's quartet of novels about Harry Rabbit Angstrom, who gives a shit about Rabbit? Well, I did. I happen to love those books. Theirs was the kind of thinking that made them unable to rightly champion works outside the white male canon without trashing everything within that canon, sight unseen, along with anyone who had anything positive to say about it. 
Theirs was the kind of thinking that led them to see no irony in the generalities they made with such abandon, dismissals of whole segments of the population, whites, men, heterosexuals. And theirs was the kind of thinking that led to an exchange I had one day in the mid-1990s. I belonged for a couple of years during that period to a small writing group that met in Park Slope diners and coffee shops. We traded work, all fiction, and sometimes passed around works by established writers that we had found interesting or useful. One week I gave the others a short story I had written as well as the story that had inspired it, You Can't Tell a Man by the Song He Sings from Philip Roth's collection, Goodbye Columbus. An early short work infused with elements that attract me to his writing as a whole. The shock of recognition at his character's quirks and contradictions, the passages that made me laugh aloud. With the two other people who showed up that week, both women, I discussed my story, then tried to talk about the Philip Roth piece. One of the women made a few observations about it. The other simply said, I didn't read Philip. It was not those four words that ended the conversation, but their tone, hard and dry like four gray granite walls of a closed off room containing fixed, unchangeable ideas. It didn't matter that the unspoken rules of our little group obligated her to read the things that other members passed along. It didn't matter that another member of the group had seen something of value in this short story and thought she and others might too. Her unwillingness to risk being made uncomfortable as a reader and her pre preconceived notions about Roth, what some assumed from his fiction to be his negative attitude toward women, overrode the rules of our writing group. And so she didn't read Philip. That kind of thinking still drives me crazy. But I now think that my contempt for the fetishization of victimhood interfered with my ability to tell the difference between such self-righteous xenophobia and legitimate complaint. To put it as plainly as possible, I was a good man with a blind spot. I was never indifferent to white racism, and I don't want to suggest that I ever was. All the attention paid during that period to Charles Murray's idiotic book, The Bell Curve, for example, with its 19th century theories about race and intelligence nearly made blood come out of my nose. I was not unaware that racism continued to plague the black community. And yet, I understood that black children in poor neighborhoods faced disadvantages from the word go, and I knew about racism and everything from housing to employment to the legal system to environmental health. I knew that kind of racism needed to be fought. I knew it was behind the need to sell drugs, which was behind a lot of the violence. And yet, with no concrete evidence to go on, I wondered if black people should be doing something to help ourselves, something central and crucial, something that had little to do with white racism that we weren't doing. But in any case, there it was, my particular rootedness, which gave me a sense of connectedness to my heritage, allowed me to continue exploring the works of other cultures while feeling secure in my own culture, made me able to operate in the world with confidence and made me deep inside, maybe just a little self-satisfied. But there was trouble in paradise. Oh. I would Indeed. conclude there. If it ever was paradise. If it ever was paradise, indeed. Um, uh, how does, how, I mean, uh, do you think you clearly were, you know, you clearly had a very strong sense of, of belonging. You were in no way insensitive to the issue of racism. You felt it, felt right. it deeply, but there was this um, impatience, mm -hmm. right? A kind mm -hmm. of, yeah. maybe not get over it, but, you know, an impatience at least with a certain, as you said, fetishization of, of, of oppression. Yeah, um, yeah. Today, I think you're a little more skeptical, though, about that, that impatience. That, that, and I wonder, do you think that, was it, do you think you had been, um, had you been lulled into a certain complacency? Or do you think, what do you think was going on? I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think. Um, because you don't, you don't explain that so much as the shock of yeah. Trump. Right, and then the house, you know, crumbled, house, and you had to right. piece it together again. But what, sure. what do you think had happened? Um, yeah, um, I think there was um, a tiny bit of skepticism. Um, well, I, I should say that uh, when I was growing up, um, I, I very much grew up with the idea that um, it was, you know, as I say in the book, it was it's very important to. If you have to judge people at all, it's important to judge people as individuals, you know, that you should not, uh, that um, the idea being that uh, a group that has been historically oppressed, the last thing that group should do is turn around and and um, and practice prejudice against other people. So it, it so it, so that that was that was the basis of my of my thinking. And um, it made me uncomfortable. Um, 
it, you know, it's certainly understandable to be wary, but it made me uncomfortable when people of any color dismissed whole groups of people, no matter who they were, right? I, I felt and feel that um, uh, all pre no prejudice is a good thing, in my view, right? Um, and so any sort of wholesale dismissal of, of any people makes me uncomfortable. Um, I, I think what's changed from then to now is is um, is more of an understanding of um, well, more of an understanding of 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 systemic racism, but all, and and more of an understanding or um, of, um, of of people who who sort of can't get to my view of things, because certainly the twenty sixteen election caused me to question my own my own views. So mm -hmm. I, I would say that I I have a certain amount of um, of sympathy, and, and I, I don't mean that in the sense of like you know condescension or anything like that, but 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 just uh, or maybe empathy is a better word for mm -hmm. for views that are 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 radically different from mine in terms of you know in terms of being. I will never, you know, I, I will go to my grave trying not to be prejudiced against any group, but mm -hmm. I understand people who are. I, mm -hmm. I, that might be the simplest way to put it. You know, I wonder too whether whether your understanding the evolution of your understanding of, mm -hmm. of racism, mm -hmm. of, 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 let's say, implicit bias, um, mm -hmm. of uh, whether, what, you know, whether that evolution was also shaped by an experience that, that forms a, an important, you know, part of your book, and that is fatherhood and mm -hmm. being the father of two daughters who, are, who have a white mother. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and yeah. going out with them into the world and seeing how you're perceived uh, by others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Has that also been in some ways a kind of crucial uh, influence on how you've understood uh, the question of race in America? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, just, just listening to you uh, ask that question, I, I, it occurs to me that uh, the, the, the effect on me has been sort of twofold. I mean, um, you know, if, if you are out in public, uh, if, if you're a black man, you're out in public and uh, with your, with your light skinned, you know, or, or lighter skinned daughters, you're going to get some, uh, a variety of, of responses. Um, and so I, I would say that uh, that experience has on the one hand, um, yeah, yeah, but well, has on the one hand, you know, certainly uh, kept me sensitive to to uh, racial attitudes in America, but but at the same time, has uh, strengthened my um, my conviction that those the, those attitudes are, are are misguided. I my relationship with my daughters, you know, you you might not look at my daughters and 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 necessarily think they're black. Um, our our bond is such that um, it, it 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 really flies in the face of the notion of difference. I would say between between people of different skin colors because um, I you know I I they're young women now. I love these young women like um, uh, like you wouldn't believe. I, you know they're they're, um, they're they're my heart and um, um, as as their mother is and um, that. Uh, yeah, so I, I I would say I would say the experience of, of raising biracial kids has has th those those would be the effects I would say mm -hmm. on me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know your 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 book um, makes a a, a, a very uh, interesting and in some ways surprising shift mm -hmm. um, about two thirds of the way through uh, when you're moved by this desire to speak to people mm. uh, who have, you know, cast their vote for Donald Trump. And you fly out sure. to California and you have conversations with people. And yeah. you come to, come to a rather, I'm, I'm wondering whether you could maybe talk a bit about, about how that experience um, affected you and also about how it led you uh, to the view that indifference as much as, if not more than racism, is uh, you know, as you put it, the the, the cold heart of the problem in American mm, society mm -hmm. today. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, you, you know what? What I decided to do 
um, what I tried to do was get a sense of um, what people were thinking when they voted for for Donald Trump. And you know, to to understand that completely, of course, you'd have to kind of look into the hearts and minds of millions of people, which of course I could not do. What I thought I would try to do other uh, instead was um, was ha conduct a, a small number of in depth interviews with uh, with you know, a fairly disparate group. So some of that group were, uh, uh, a few of that group were Trump supporters. So yes, I, I went to California and I met with um, two gentlemen out there who were uh, both over 70, white, retired, and and Trump supporters. Um, they, I, I met them through uh, friends of mine who lived out there and um, they welcomed me into their homes. Um, uh, they were very, they were very friendly. Uh, you know, it, uh, at one point we sat in the, the backyard of one of the men and, and shared beers, you know, we clinked glasses. Um, and, uh, and th there was nothing, you know, th there was nothing in the way that they welcomed me to suggest that they had any sort of animosity toward me or toward, toward other black people. Of course, when we started talking, you know, th they were very much of, uh, they were very adamant that they were, um, as they like to put it, colorblind. You know that the, the color didn't matter to them, and yet, uh, you know, every, every so often uh, they would uh, it would become clear that they held views that were negative that that they might not have understood themselves were negative. Um, and what also became clear is just their ignorance about the conditions facing many Black Americans. Um, and. Uh, it, it was it was funny. What, one of the one of the men I talked to, um, we we our conversation ranged um, uh, over a number of areas, and I was asking him uh, what he thought about the women's movement, and he said that he had a conversation with a woman who was a feminist, and he said um, he said, well, let me ask you this. Um, let's agree that there is uh, inequality in the workplace between women men and women. If I'm a man, why should I want to change that? This is what he asked me. And I, and I think, uh, I think, and you know, how do you answer that question? How do, how do you respond to that? Um, and, I, and I think that's, I think that's fairly representative of, uh, of a number of uh, uh, people's attitudes. It's not so much that. Well, that was the, I mean, I think, wasn't that the conclusion of like a whole generation or at least part of a generation mm -hmm. of civil rights militants in the let's say the mid 1960s who said, mm -hmm. look, it's not a question of winning hearts and minds. It's a question of power and we need black power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That yeah. was the response to that when they came up mm -hmm. against that wall. Right. 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 But I think you know, they felt the limitations of moral suasion. Right. 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 Yeah. I mean, I, I think there, I think there are limits because um, I think I get, you know, a, a lot of what's going on. Look, obviously, racism accounts for a, a, a good chunk of Trump support, I would say. But I, but I think also, there is, um, there is just this great wall of of indifference, and people can not particularly like the racist aspects of Trump, but it will it will not stop them from supporting him if he represents what they think are their own interests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think the combination yeah. of, you know, I think the combination of, of, of racism, uh, uh, indifference, uh, ignorance about the conditions that the people face, and also a certain amount of denial, because, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I talk in the book about uh, what I call the concept of rootedness. So the men I talked to were very much rooted in the idea of, of America as a, as a land of fairness. And, uh, and so if you're rooted in a particular idea, you, you tend to dismiss things that go against that idea. So mm -hmm. if... So you know, if, if someone suggests to you, "Look, uh, uh, this 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 country is not fair. It's 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 tilted toward um, you know in 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 favor of people like you," they're going to resist that idea. So I think denial right. is is right a big, from is a from uh, from ec economics to politics to the uh, sure. flesh tone the flesh tone of Crayola. Exactly, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. All the way down. Yeah, all the way down. Um, yeah. And then, uh, but of course, but they defend these so called. Um, uh, norms and this idea of fair play because they're structured in a way that suits their interests. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so they, yeah. and, and this is also true of the whole notion as, uh, of colorblindness, as you point right. out in your book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think yeah. at one point you suggest that colorblindness is like looking at a pregnant woman on a, on a, on a, on a subway car and not noticing she's pregnant. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have, we're, we're going to, I think we should move now to um, some questions. 
We have some questions here. Um, and actually, uh, one of the questions we have uh, is, I think, uh, uh, is a nice segue from mm. uh, from your comments just now about uh, about indifference and uh, about uh, Trump's base of support and so on. Um, the question is, uh, from what you've seen, mm. what has been the most surprising but effective way of breaking someone out of closed mindedness? If someone were to ask you for tips, mm. how would you recommend engaging someone uh, that might help them to stop judging when mm. that's all they know or grew up with and to start connecting instead? Mm. I guess I would, I would answer that by saying um, no one wants to be, no one is going to be shouted into submission. You know? um, I would, I would start by listening to what they have to say, um, not agreeing with it, but um, but not uh, not making them feel um, as if they're being attacked. I, I I think I think that's the I think that's the where you have to start. Um, and you know it, it's it's funny. I, I got a um, I got an email uh, to my website from a man in uh, Texas who. Um, uh, who had voted for Trump and somebody gave him a copy of my book and I, I don't know if my book turned him around but but he's definitely not voting for Trump again and um, and he he thanked me for like you know uh, kind of introducing him to some ideas that that he had not thought about and um, you know I I, th I think the tone I try to adopt in the book is not of one is not of that of somebody who just knows everything um, and and I think uh, I think maybe that's what he responded to. And so, you know, the, the old, uh, the soft answer turneth away wrath, you know, um, mm -hmm. that's, that's where mm -hmm. I start. That's where I mm -hmm. start. Yeah. Well, I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, your, your tone is, is, uh, is very inviting mm -hmm. and, uh, very soft spoken, very, yeah. very introspective and so, mm -hmm. and self questioning. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there are even, there, there are even some rather, you know, quite touching, uh, asides about, about being a father, for example, and you wonder, mm -hmm. do I have what it takes to protect these these daughters of mine and to guide them into the world? Yeah, yeah. and uh, they're 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 very moving. Um, mm, thank you. Uh, you know, we haven't talked a lot about uh, about music, which is tremendously mm. um, important to you. Mm. Um, I mean, musical figures. Uh, appear in many of your, your paintings. You've mm -hmm. written about, about uh, Ellington and, and Ben Webster and so many of the great monks, so many yeah. of the great jazz musicians. Yeah. Um, and I think one of, the, uh, you know, one of the things that I want to sort of emphasize here before going to, to this question is that like a number of like distinguished American and especially African-American intellectuals, uh, you understand that jazz uh, has a significance that goes well beyond music. Mm -hmm. That jazz, the mm -hmm. jazz embodies a whole philosophy of of existence, of collaboration. Even some would argue democratic practice. That there's mm -hmm. something special about improvisation. Can you can you talk a little bit about what jazz has meant to you uh, sure. as a writer? Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, I, my uh, fondness for jazz or love for jazz actually started before um, I began to attach it to any sort of uh, historical importance. But, um, but you mentioned the word improvisation and um, it, you know, I've, I've long seen a connection between um, the improvisation that is at the heart of, um, of, of playing jazz and, and improvisation as a key element of, of, the black American story, you know, imp improvisation implying that um, uh, that there is not necessarily a clear way forward. That you have to find a way. You have to improvise to get past to get through to meet a challenge. And you know, two key instances of that are, uh, uh, you know, in, in the the nineteenth century when the challenge was, you know, how how do you how do you overcome slavery? And one of the one of the answers is the Underground Railroad. You know, this was an instance of 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 uh, improvisation, I would call it, you know, um, and so was the civil rights movement, you know, so uh, black Americans are struggling to uh, realize the rights that we had supposedly been granted 100 years earlier. Um, 
And so um, the, the the methods used there were, you know, that there again was no was no clear way forward um, necessarily. So so the civil rights movement, I, I think, represented um, I, I inventive thinking in the face of a of a challenge. So so. Jazz to me symbolizes all of that, and mm. uh, it, it adds and, a, and, al and along with this improvisation and f and the freedom that implies structure, discipline, reflection, mm. preparation, organization. Sure. Right? right, right, yeah, absolutely, and and so it adds another dimension to to the joy of listening to the music for me. Mm. Yeah, uh, we have a, a, a jazz question here. Mm. Uh, okay, what what in your view is Coleman Hawkins' greatest track? <laughs> wow. Um, there's a record that I, I don't think is that well known. Um, it's, it is probably my favorite, uh, uh, Coleman Hawkins record. It's, it's called, uh, Coleman Hawkins and Roy Eldridge at the, at the opera house. And, uh, there are, uh, cuts, um, there's a cut called Beanstalking, uh, where, uh, uh, Coleman Hawkins and, and the trumpeter Roy Eldridge, uh, trade fours. And there's just, there's just such a joy in that performance that I, I it just makes me happy every time I hear it. Um, so I don't I know. know if this is I, I know the record because you gave it to me. Because I gave it to you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. 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 I, you know, I, I, you know, just I'm, well, one. We have time for just one last question, which, mm -hmm. which I'm going to ask you because it's, you know, and the question is this, um, Cliff. I think that you know so often when uh when writers especially black writers are asked to comment on uh the american political condition on race mm -hmm. they are asked to inhabit these um polarized spaces one pessimism the other optimism as if one could issue some kind of verdict about America, which is an unfolding project, and we right. don't know where it's going. Right now, it doesn't look so good, but right. I mean, right. the battle is not over. Battle's not over. Um, yeah. You know, your your book moves in, I think, in, in, an, in an interesting uh, way, a very kind of um, inconclusive way between mm. this defiant, very stoical hope of someone like Albert Murray, Right, who, mm -hmm. who, you know, really does not want anyone to see him as a victim, right? And right. he's right. he is above that, yeah. and yeah. and and then the the much more kind of tragic and vulnerable, and sometimes despairing attitude of James Baldwin, who himself goes through many different moods with mm -hmm. respect mm -hmm. to race in the states. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Baldwin of the nineteen forties is very different from the Baldwin of the 1960s and from the Baldwin of the 70s. Sure, um, sure. I'm wondering where, where, what, what, I'm not asking you to, to, um, to choose one or the other. Yeah. Right? I think that would be sure. ludicrous, but I'm wondering where in 2020, you know, amid, you know, the COVID-19 virus, the Trump presidency and, right. and this, you know, very uh, kind of difficult ordeal that, that we're experiencing, which of course has profound repercussions among black and brown people in sure. the United States. Yeah. yeah. Where, 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 is, where is your mood these days with respect to, to these issues? How are, you, yeah. how are you feeling? These are tough times to state the obvious. Um, I don't think it's really possible to to go forward um, without a certain amount of hope, you know. And and um, I look, you know, let, let's go back to uh, let's go back to the 1890s, you know, with uh, uh, Plessy uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, and and uh, you know that that was that was a time or 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 the end of Reconstruction, you know. There were there were times when um, uh, black people had seen years of hope only to have uh, doors closed, and you know I I think if but you know black people kept fighting after that, and um, I think if um, I think if they can do that you know I can get through this, you know that's that that's one answer I'd have. I tried in my book to reflect both my. Um, a, a sense of optimism and a sense of joy, but also uh, um, 
moments of, uh, of, of questioning the whole enterprise. But on the whole, um, I retain, I retain a certain amount of optimism. Um, you know, I, I try to, uh, I, I try to be hopeful while keeping my eyes open. That's uh, probably the best way I, I know to put it. So. Thank you so much, Cliff. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Have thank you. Book. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for joining us. And I'm Shane from Town Hall, Seattle. I just wanted to thank everybody for, uh, for turning in today. Uh, um, you can purchase the book by clicking the buy the book button from our, our partners at Third Place Books. If you'd like to continue supporting these programs, feel free to click the donate button. Any support is greatly appreciated. Thank you again so much, and we hope to see you at another event in the future. All right.